shots. This is a scene in Midland Valley High School today where hundreds got the vaccine. Today, Aiken County Schools kicked off the first of several vaccine clinics for its employees. It is the first district in our area to bring the vaccine effort inside school walls, making it really easy for those teachers. News Channel's Brady Travnell was there and talked to teachers about what this vaccine means to them. Around 300 or so Aiken County school employees are expected to get their COVID-19 vaccine today. The first group of about 1,800 total who will get the vaccine across six different clinics. The school district gave employees an opportunity to sign up starting on Monday. And Rural Health Services transformed Midland Valley High School's gym into a vaccination clinic and staff were lined up all morning giving teachers a chance to miss class only for about 30 minutes to get vaccinated. Aiken County isn't requiring staff to get the shot, but it's highly encouraging it. Mindy Tucker, Aiken County's director of elementary schools, says she's thankful the clinics are on site. Not only is it a way to do mass vaccinations at one time, but it allows teachers to do it during the day, um, not after school weekends on their personal time. Just feeling like maybe some sense of normalcy is going to possibly come back. And this is the first clinic for Aiken County Schools. Five more will follow over the next several weeks across different schools. And hear how this whole effort came about on News 12 at 6 o'clock. Reporting in Aiken County, Brady Trapnell on your side. And on the Georgia side, three and a half million more people will be eligible for the vaccine starting next week. Monday, eligibility expands to people 55 and older and those with serious health conditions. In a briefing yesterday, Governor Kemp said if the supply continues to increase, he's ready to expand a little while again in April. And he's confident vaccines can open up to all adults in just a matter of weeks. If you're a veteran and looking to get vaccinated, the Charlie Norwood VA has a clinic tomorrow for you. That'll be at their center downtown from 9 to 2. And you can set up an appointment by calling the number on your screen. Doesn't matter your age or what category you fall in and what state. You just have to be a veteran. AU Health also holding a clinic tomorrow at their Washington Square site. But those spots are all full, unfortunately. Much more news ahead of Reed moving in next week in that full forecast. Thank you, Riley. First at five, we're hearing from local teachers after the death of a 19-year-old college student from Edgefield. Officials say Ryan Wood died Wednesday on Furman University's campus, where he was a first-year student. He's also a strong Furman High School alumni, and his former teachers tell us they're going to remember him for his huge heart. Looks to me deceiving. Ryan was a teddy bear. I think the term that comes to mind for me is he was a gentle giant with a heart of gold. I agree with Ms. Jackson. Ryan was a teddy bear, um, that, that he was he was outstanding. He, he was quiet at times, but he was outstanding in every, everything that he would try to do for all of us. And yeah, he was that teddy bear. Today, investigators are still working to figure out how Ryan died. His family says he was just a kid who loved the Lord and his family, and they're grateful right now for all the prayers coming in for their son. There's some new developments in a shootout at a Columbia motorcycle shop. We're learning the man killed was from here at home. 55-year-old Charles Lilly from Beach Island was killed during that incident. This was the scene yesterday at Capital City Cycles on Two Notch Road, where five people were shot there. Deputies have now arrested two men. Officials say James Hill is charged with murder and also assault. Christopher Wheat is charged with obstruction. Four others were taken to the hospital from the scene yesterday. Two of those are still being treated. Bond says Augusta mother accused of killing her one-year-old son, 21-year-old Selena Tyler Scott, appeared in court this morning where a judge set her bond at $60,000. Both she and the child's father, Tyone Scott, face murder and cruelty to children charges. They're accused of repeatedly turning off their son's ventilator, leading to his death. Tyrone was in bond court last week. His bond also set at $60,000. Also in court, Tyone Lambert, he's behind bars in connection to the murder of Joe Nunley Jr. Deputies say Lambert hit and killed Nunley with a shovel back on February 24th. Lambert was denied bond today. The search is still on this afternoon for an inmate who escaped the Jefferson County Jail. Take a look at your screen here. Authorities say this is who they're looking for. Jonah Schaefner, he's on the run, he's considered armed and dangerous, and he was serving nine years in prison on federal firearm charges. Now he faces even more charges for breaking out. If you have any information on where he might be, call the number on your screen, and there is a $2,500 reward attached to that. In Waynesboro, investigators are asking for your help tracking down this man accused of burglary at a local bank. It happened yesterday at the Southern Bank on Liberty Street. Police say 
say the suspect got in by smashing through a window. If you can help identify the person in these pictures, call Waynesboro PD. And the number right here on the screen is 706-284-9422. Heads up, Richmond County Tutors, we are learning. Well, get your baseball caps ready. The Atlanta Braves are going to welcome fans back to the stadium for their home opener. Baseball, bring it on. The team plans to open Truist Park at 33% capacity. It'll be the first time fans get to experience the game in person since October of 2019. Here's the plan. There will be socially distant pods for people to sit in, and, of course, mask requirements. But the Braves are going to face off against the Philadelphia Phillies April the 9th. And here at home, some big news on the sports front. The Cross Creek High School boys and girls basketball teams, both officially state champs. What it are just the happened, chances? right? The boys just took home the win in the last couple of hours, 57 to 49. The girls won this afternoon, finishing their season with a 23 and 2 record. That wow. is a school full of talent right now. And you can't forget about the Josie girls winning the state championship in their division yesterday. Our sports director, Mike Yakachonis, was there for all of the action. We're going to hear from him and those winning teams coming up on News 12 at 6 o'clock. But congratulations, my goodness. We are just rich with talent. Uh, Augusta's a championship city in a lot of ways right now. Riley? That is awesome. Big congratulations to Cross Creek. We are expecting a nice weekend. So breaking news just into our newsroom, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp has signed a new executive order reinstating the state's public health of emergency. There are a few changes to this. So first of all, restaurants puts restaurants and bars under the same COVID standards. The new order goes into effect tonight at midnight, last through March 31st. We're going to have more on this coming up in the next half hour. We'll break it all down for you. But again, a new executive COVID-19 order signed in Georgia. Coming up next, there's a new restaurant open in downtown Aiken, bringing a new taste to that area. We're going to show you around after a quick break. Stolen guns turned crime guns. The I team uncovers Augusta is a hot spot for recovering illegal weapons. We have firearms that are trafficked out of the state of Georgia. And an infamous stretch of roadway isn't helping. Monday on News 12 at 6 o'clock. We've all seen small businesses struggling through this pandemic, but we've all seen plenty get back on their feet and some even taking on a new adventure. And there is a new restaurant just opening up today in our area. News 12's Tradisha Woodard shows us how it's bringing a different taste to downtown Aiken. For Ming Chang. Oh, man, I love Ming Chang. The more options, the better. If you want to have a steak somewhere downtown, I'm sure I can find one somewhere. But, you know, I feel like seafood's not as popular or maybe just not as dominant in down, down here. That's why Erica Jones, the co-owner of Palmetto Seafood, says she wanted to bring something different to downtown Aiken. Perfect location, the perfect spot, the perfect city, because Aiken is definitely growing. She says it's not only a different kind of food, but also a different kind of flavor. It'll take your taste buds on a journey. We have a secret sauce that we use. We have our own um, garlic butter sauce that we make from scratch. So, and no one knows the recipe. We, we keep it secret on purpose. She says the community is overwhelmed with excitement, and they've welcomed them with open arms. People have come in and asked, are y'all open? Are y'all open? And we have to constantly tell them, no, it's coming, it's coming. She says it's all about meeting new people and seeing new faces. You will be satisfied. That That is guaranteed. And building new relationships with seafood lovers like Shane. It's awesome. I'm a foodie, so I like to eat different things. So just giving us more choices is, is a really good feeling, right? You always want to have more options. With more options and choices to choose from, you just have more people coming out here. Tradisha Woodard, on your side. We love more choices. Yes. We love secret sauces that have the word butter in them. Wait, well, that's what I was going to ask you. What you, what you think's in the secret sauce? I don't know, but I dip whatever she serves. Yeah, whatever she serves me, I'm putting in that secret sauce. Give it a okay, try. Okay. It's Palmetto Seafood. They just officially opened a few hours ago, so all the waiting is over. Congratulations on getting this thing open during a pandemic. They're going to be open Monday through Friday from 1 in the afternoon until 10 at night. So oh, that's great. Good. good hours to scoot over there. Definitely going to put that on my list. Another chance for you to grab some good local food. The Augusta Greek Festival's Greek to Go drive through is open all weekend long. It's open for a few more hours tonight until 8 o'clock. Then they'll be back open tomorrow from 11 to 8 and 11 to 4 on Sunday. You can hop in the drive through line on Telfair Street. They're also doing delivery this year, so that's pretty convenient. You yeah. don't even have to leave your house to eat feta fries anymore, which uh, is really dangerous for me personally. Yeah. But. <laughs> <laughs> Easy directions. Drive downtown, roll your windows down, and you'll smell your way. And the smells are 
screen, which is fantastic. Oh. All right, the Augusta Great Festival is going dry through just one way as we've seen the COVID change our local food scene. But tomorrow we're taking a closer look at the pandemic's impact in a primetime special. It's called COVID Crisis, The Long Haul. Investigate TV's Sandra Jones shows us how restaurants are fighting to stay in business. Three years ago, Pittman Shaw opened the doors and brought a new flavor to the area. It definitely was word of mouth. It's standing out on the sidewalk, handing out menus, trying to get people to come in. Eventually, they did. Business was booming until COVID struck. What went through your mind? We were right in the middle of it when I started thinking, you know, how it would impact the business. Being a startup, you're, you're already struggling, trying to make things work and make things make sense. So again, that's coming up tomorrow. Uh, so many restaurants sharing a similar story. Tune in tomorrow night for a closer look at the pandemic's toll on small businesses and more. COVID crisis, the long haul, it airs at 8 o'clock right here on CBS. Stay and drive for your Saturday tax credit coming your way. Lots of people will start checking their bank accounts this weekend. That is the earliest your stimulus checks could start rolling in. But President Biden signed that massive relief bill just yesterday. And if you have kids, the relief bill could be big in another way. Celeste Springer is live in the studio to explain how. Celeste. The bill is set to give families with kids under the age of six $3,600 per child and $3,000 for each of your kids who are between the ages of six and 17. In a typical year, in order to get a child tax credit, you must have been working. That's a thing of the past this year. I spoke with a tax professional who tells me there's a lot of big changes that you need to know about. She tells me this could benefit millions of families more than ever before. Calling all parents. Your tax credit is going to look a lot different this year. There's no phase in rate, and what that means is you get the full credit regardless of whether your parent earns money or not. And that's a huge change in how taxes are typically delivered. In a typical year, working parents only receive around $2,000 per child. This year, the system will benefit more low-income families by giving them more money. Nationally, there are roughly 10 million children who were projected to be in poverty for 2021. This legislation drops that number to about 5 million, roughly cutting poverty in half. For many kids who come here to the Boys and Girls Club, it could mean a world of a difference. But we do get kids from across the board, but I will say 72% of our club kids are living um, at or below the poverty level in Augusta. The Boys and Girls Club gives each kid here a snack and dinner, something many of us take for granted. According to the Golden Harvest, about 30% or 14,000 Richmond County kids face food insecurity. And with such a high need, many are hopeful there's change headed towards our kids who need it the most. Because if they're not getting their basic needs met, then that's affecting them for a lifetime. Celeste Springer, on your side. The Tax Policy Center says you're going to get half your credit in payments until December. That means you'll see some of that money earlier than ever before. They tell us it's still up to the Treasury if those payments will come monthly or quarterly. New tonight from the I-Team, Georgia's two senators want a federal probe into the Georgia Department of Labor, citing a, quote, egregious system breakdown. This is a letter to the U.S. Department of Labor. It is from Senators Ossoff and Warnock, and they want a federal investigation into exactly what's happening here in Georgia. They're citing severe delays in unemployment benefits that you've told us all about. What's more, Congress sent $67 million of our tax dollars to Atlanta to help the state process all of these unemployment claims in a timely manner during the pandemic. Tonight, 180,000 claims are still pending. 400,000 Georgians are now getting benefits, but they say it took weeks and months of calls and emails to get those claims processed and their money finally in hand. All new tonight, we heard even lawmakers trying to call the constituents to have still couldn't get through to the Georgia Department of Labor. So state lawmakers also want this investigation to go forward. They are citing a lack of transparency, discrepancies in data reported, and violations of federal statutes requiring timely payment. Now it's up to the Inspector General of the U.S. Department of Labor to look at all of this to decide if an investigation is warranted, and the I-Team will continue to follow this request through Capitol Hill and what it means for you. Much more news ahead, but let's have a look at some rain moving in by next week coming up in that full forecast. Riley, thanks a lot. What are the chances of this? Both Cross Creek girls and boys basketball teams winning the state championship. I mean, when you're good, you're good. And they've got a whole school full of good right now. Just 24 hours after the Josie girls became state champs, 
as well. So huge congratulations to both of those teams. Sports Director, director Mike Yakachonis was there as Cross Creek dominated and they came out on top. The big team coming into this season for both the Cross Creek boys and girls was redemption. The girls fell in the Elite Eight, the boys fell in the state championship just a season ago. Now with a chance to really get things back in the right direction as both teams played in the state finals on Friday. The Cross Creek faithful were out in force. Aside from some foul trouble in the first quarter, the Razorback girls never looked like they were going to win this game. And Coach Kim Schlein was so confident about this team, she began making plans in December. It feels amazing. It feels absolutely amazing. You won't believe this, but December 29th, I designed my ring. It's been sitting in the inbox ready to go since December 29th. The boys had a challenge with five-star Auburn commit Jabari Smith on Sandy Creek, but this one started the same way it finished. Antoine Lorick opened the game with a dunk and closed it out the same way as the Razorback boys claimed their first state title in program history. After last year's loss, head coach Lawrence Kelly says he can sleep a little easier. We, we're going to enjoy this win. We'll take, we'll take a few weeks. I ain't going to say we're going to take a lot of weeks. We're going to take a few weeks, and then we'll be back in the gym working. A lot of people go on about the Savannah area, the Atlanta area, having great ball players, but in Augusta we have very good ball players as well. A storybook ending for all three of our Richmond County schools, as all three are bringing home state titles for Cross Creek boys and girls, and it's the first in both programs' history. In Mason, Mike Jack Jonas on your side. Congratulations to yeah. those teams. What a year, man. Mm -hmm. Some of the first teachers in Aiken County Public Schools got the vaccine today. Those teachers are on cloud nine right now. Aiken County, the first district in our area to bring those doses right to their schools to make it easy for them. This is Midland Valley High School, the first of several clinics in Aiken County will have in their schools. And Brady Travel was at the clinic today and talked to those making that possible. Several hundred school staff are getting vaccinated today here at Midland Valley High School. A small bit and a large fight to get schools back to normal. A lot of excitement in there, a lot of chatter. It's a sigh of relief. For a while, the vaccine felt so far away, but now for teachers at Midland Valley High, it's a walk down the hall. Not only is it a way to do mass vaccinations at one time, but it allows teachers to do it during the day. Mindy Tucker is Aiken County's director of elementary schools. She says most teachers are excited and relieved. I think they've done a superb job in overcoming those challenges and learning how to do school in a different way this year. It sure is different. The school gym has been difficult for the teachers, turned into a vaccination site by rural health services. We already have a relationship with Aiken County Schools and doing school health services at several of their schools. Nursing students from Denmark Tech pitched in to help too. So it was outside it would mean a lot more difficult for us to get it. Don Penseal says he's not only excited for a more normal end to the school year, but to see someone he loves. You know, my mom's 81 years old. I want to make sure I was protected. You know, she's had her shots and I was able to see her as much. So me being able to get the shots will make me feel comfortable going to visit her. Aiken County is doing five more clinics on site at schools across the county. More than half of their employees are set to get the shot. Just feeling like maybe some sense of normalcy is going to possibly come back. Aiken County Schools did not require the vaccine, but they are encouraging it for all school staff. And they say they're trying to vaccinate as many people as possible to try and keep schools five days a week. Reporting in Aiken County, Brady Trapnell on your side. And Aiken County's next teacher clinic is Tuesday. That one will be at Silver Bluff High School. On the Georgia side, AU Health is getting people vaccinated at the clinic at the old Stein Mart on Washington Road. They have another clinic tomorrow. Yesterday, more than 2,300 people were vaccinated at AU's vaccination sites. They've averaged 300 vaccinations an hour, five people every minute, and they are hoping to vaccinate 10,000 people this week alone. Also today, a former teacher who's seen students rallying to her support in Jefferson County is speaking out for the first time today. Kanisha Roberts held a news conference earlier this afternoon with her attorney in front of the Jefferson County Board of Education office. Students and others gathering to support her there. We told you yesterday Ms. Roberts was going to resign from Jefferson County High School at the end of the year over concerns about the way different school events have been handled. But before that, she says she was terminated. Roberts says she'll keep fighting. And I'm going to stand here and do every single thing I can to make sure I get back in the classroom with nice students. Okay. I love them. I see them standing out here to support me. I love you. The 
district superintendent releasing a statement this afternoon. She says the school system is reviewing each concern Roberts has, but says the district cannot comment. For the first time, we are hearing from local teachers tonight after the death of a 19-year-old college student from Edgefield. Officials say Ryan Wood died Wednesday on Furman University's campus where he was a freshman. He graduated from Strom Thurmond High School, and teachers there remember just how involved and talented Ryan was. He was in chorus. He was in drama. He was in Teach Cadet. He was in mock trial. He was an incredibly smart young man. He was definitely a multi-dimensional talent. I mean, he was an actor, he was a musician, he was an orator, and he excelled at all of those things. Investigators are still working to figure out how Wood died. His family says they are grateful for all of the prayers coming in for their side. A polling place being moved in Richmond actual election. So if you normally vote there, instead on Tuesday, you're going to vote at the Henry Brigham Community Center instead. Golden Harvest spreading its reach in the River Region. Today, the food bank opened up a new facility in Aiken. Golden Harvest says this will really help them serve Aiken County better and the surrounding counties in South Carolina. Officials say they hope this will also bring a lot more opportunities for people to volunteer. Another new art installation in downtown Augusta going up today. Check it out. This one's uh, right by the Westview office on 11th and Broad. The artist Leonard Zimmerman from the area. He is, has one of his latest pieces entitled Monkey Business. It's his take on the classic Barrel of Monkeys toy. We all remember that one. Yes. Zimmerman has been busy. He also worked on the Yes You Can mural that we showed you here last week. Oh, so. I can tell. My son is going to love that monkey one. That's that one's, really that cool. one's cute. Yeah, I like that. it. That is very cool. I used to love playing with those as a little kid. We are expecting a dry weekend, but rain chances next week, they will be going up. We'll focus on that coming up in the full forecast. And we've all noticed all the smoke in the air recently. We're going to explain why and exactly what these prescribed burns really do. Plus, one violent man makes a dozen calls a day just to wish people happy birthday, and he remembers them all. But we're going to tell you about the new battle Chuck McCormick is facing. If you tell him your birthday, he will always remember that. He'll always also tell you what day of the week it falls on. Chuck McCormick, a number man and an expert when it comes to dates. Chuck has autism and his brain is super sharp, but his body is fighting cancer right now. Nick Proto tells us what keeps him going. If you've ever wondered what day of the week you were born, May 24th, 1997, Chuck McCormick can tell you. It's Saturday. Jake and see from home. He was right. Chuck has autism, but has a knack for remembering numbers, especially dates. April 3rd, 2003. That was on the Thursday. Am I right, Nick? You're right. Yes, sir. Chuck has thousands of birthdays memorized, and his nightly routine is to make birthday calls, about a dozen every day. He starts about 7.30, and his latest is 9.30. He has to quit at 9.30. While Chuck's mind is as sharp as ever, his body is fighting an uphill battle. It was colon cancer. Nance metastasized his liver. Even battling cancer, Chuck makes sure to show everyone love on their birthday. I appreciate you calling. Well, I know it's Sunday, but happy birthday anyway. If he's feeling too sick, his parents make the calls for him. He makes people so happy. They're so happy to hear from him. And people make sure he feels that same love when his birthday comes around. His parents say they have four phones just to keep up with all the messages. When it's my birthday, people phone rings off the hook and stuff, and they type in happy birthday on Facebook. In Blackville, Nick Proto, on your side. That's just fantastic and really amazing, but Chuck's uh, parents just want to give a big thank you to everyone who has supported them in this journey, uh, but an amazing one it's been. Absolutely, just a savant, you know, and just interested in people. You can tell what a sweet soul he is, and they say Chuck also loves getting cards, so if you want to wish him well, we'll tell you how to do that on our website. Let's flood his mailbox. Yeah, you know all those phones they have, they're going to need that many mailboxes. Yes, too. think of all of them. the birthdays he's remembered, and just let's amazing. give that love the back. The day of the week and the year and all that. That's Incredible. Right in his head. Incredible. Okay, Riley, taking a peek outside over Wheeler Road. We've probably noticed smoky skies this week. We've had a lot of controlled burns in the area recently. Yes, we have. Close to 2 million acres of land managed through planned fires in Georgia and South Carolina every year. Riley Hale explains why these burns are so important. The smell of smoke is common this time of year in the CSRA. While smoke from prescribed burns can be an inconvenience, they do serve a purpose. Just know this, that burning is not bad. Burning is good. It creates awesome 
awesome habitat and it's the way to go if you want to have really good timber and really good wildlife on your property. Travis Sumner has been using controlled burns to manage land around the southeast for years. Uh, it creates really great turkey habitat uh, that for nesting and brood. Uh, it will create good bedding area for deer later on, but also the songbirds. You notice we have a few bluebird boxes in the back, so it's very beneficial. These burns diversify habitat, stimulate growth of desirable plants and trees, and help prevent catastrophic wildfires. Weather is the most important aspect of deciding when to burn. The wind direction, relative humidity, is going to play a big factor in how this fire is going to burn, how fast it will burn, uh, if it's going to get out of control. On an ideal burning day, we need a good mixing height, which means once that smoke starts, it's going to rise high in the sky and be transported away from the ground. Smoke management is key. The last thing burn managers want is smoke from their burn covering highways or affecting neighborhoods. Uh, there's prescribed fire manager courses that you're required to have and smoke management guidelines. Learn to burn classes. We've offered those here with the National Wild Turkey Federation. All kinds of help. And if you are interested in doing your own prescribed burn, we'll be sure to link some resources in this story on WRDW.com. In Edgefield County, Riley Hale on your side. And we do start seeing more and more burns this time of year when most of the trees aren't growing, other plants are dead. So that helps make a successful burn. There's such a science to it. Yeah. That we really I didn't realize all the like smoke knowledge. Go up and away. Mm -hmm. But as Riley mentioned, you can check out our website if you want to learn more about all of that. And there's a lot to know about burning correctly. Okay, a huge donation of supplies, and it goes right to one of our local school districts. We're going to tell you why this year's donations are unlike any other. Are you serious about buying? Some really good news to pass along, a huge donation of supplies for Aiken Public Schools. This is part of Staples' annual donation drive, but Zaina Halliburton tells us why this year is unlike any other. Aretha Tarver has been working with kids at Chucker Creek Elementary as a school counselor for three years. Before taking on the job, she was a teacher for 13. I saw a lot of the needs that kids had um, as, as a classroom teacher, and I felt like in the role of a school counselor, I could kind of help students with some of the home issues that they're having. She says this school year, she's seen an increase of kids who need school supplies, clothing, and even food. Harbor, once a teacher herself, understands the financial struggle teachers may face as well. I think that it all takes a toll, but this is something that we're just passionate about. So when you go into education, we know that this is something that is expected, especially when we went through the um, teacher program. I know that this is something that happens. We don't go into it blindly, but we always appreciate the help from others. A $5 donation made at Staples and Aiken paid for one of these bags full of pencils, crowns, markers, and even PPE. Paula Broadwater is the manager and says this year has been very successful. They have donated 500 school bags so far to the school district. But our teachers and educators have really saved a lot this last year, and the students and their parents as well. So any small thing that we can do, we're, we're just glad to help. Staples is still accepting donations for supplies and will keep it going throughout the year. But donations will be distributed to the schools and students they need the most. To know that there are organizations that are willing to help us is, is truly um, humbling and um, it's amazing. Tarver says seeing the community step in to support education is amazing. Whether that's the parents, um, volunteers, businesses that come and help us, we love the support from others. Zaina Halliburton on your side. And hats off to Staples. They have an additional 120 bags right now ready to be given since their last donation. They say they hope they can continue giving even more. A great service for our local schools. And if you want to make a donation and you want to help out, like they said, it's just $5. It would really go a long way. This Saturday, we cover the impact of the pandemic in the primetime special COVID crisis, The Long Haul. Investigative TV takes a closer look at how the U.S. handled the pandemic over the last year. I'm saying that we collectively as a society were damaged by our political discourse in both directions. The way I would liken it is that we would never go to war on a state by state basis. We would go as a country to, to defend our borders. We'd go as a country to defend our interests. 
we'll also look at the struggle for small businesses and what our new normal looks like with the virus. COVID crisis, the long haul, that airs tomorrow. You can catch that right after the basketball game right here on News 12. Riley? Saturday's looking great to head out to the lake. The lake's still pretty much 